This is a paradox in the sense that when Lawrence's father was working here, he was engaged in the reality of life, while Lawrence, the son, was preparing poetic fripperies which were of no value at all in the great march forward of industrial civilization. But when we talk about these two elements in Lawrence's life, the father and the mother, we'd better get this right. We like to think that Lawrence's propensity for art, beauty, came from the mother. And there was only a kind of rough masculine brutality derived from the father. It wasn't as easy as that. The miners themselves reacted against this rectangular rationalism in the direction of a desire for beauty. The wives just stood behind their white lace curtains and looked out on nothing. Now, the Colliers had also an instinct of beauty. The Colliers' wives had not. The Collier fled out of the house as soon as he could, away from the nagging materialism of the woman. With the women, it was always, this is broken. Now you've got to mend it, or else we want this, that and the other. And where is the money coming from? The Collier didn't know and didn't care very deeply. His life was otherwise. He loved the countryside, just the indiscriminating feel of it. Very often he loved his garden, and very often he had a genuine love of the beauty of flowers. I have known it often and often in Colliers. Life for him did not consist in facts, but in a flow. The women almost invariably nagged about material things. She was taught to do it. She was encouraged to do it. It was a mother's business to see that her sons got on, and it was the man's business to provide the money. Lawrence got on, but not in any sense that his mother would have approved of. True, he made the big leap into the great city of Nottingham, the first eastward boy to get a higher education there. But in Nottingham, something terrible happened. He irregularly allied himself to the aristocracy, but not the British aristocracy that ruled the coal mines. At the house of his languages professor at Nottingham University College, he fell in love with the professor's wife. The professor was H.C. Wheatley, best known as a philologist, the author of adjectives and other words. He was a good man, a warm man, but not a fiery one. His wife, Frida, responded at once to the genuine fire of the young man from Eastwood. She was fiery enough herself, a handsome woman from a noble German family. Her maiden name was von Richthofen, and her cousin was soon to be known as the Red Baron. She ran away with Lawrence with hardly a second thought, leaving not only her husband, but her three children. In a sense, she was running home, back to Europe, out of exile. Lawrence entered exile and lived and died in it. Lawrence was a provincial man, a man of the working classes. In a sense, he's the patron saint of all writers who never had an Oxford or Cambridge education, who are somewhat despised by those who have. When he published his first books, the Bloomsbury intellectuals like E.M. Forster, Bertrand Russell and Lady Ossolyn Morell patronised him. And he responded by satirising them in his books. Lady Ossoline Morell especially, an aristocratic lady, passionate, possessive, with no talent at all except for self-exhibition. With the coming of the First World War, England turned itself into a prison and Lawrence felt himself to be securely locked into it. All he could do was to shake the bars and rage in impotent fury. But some instinct drove him to this extremity of the country, very close to Land's End, from which he could look out from his bars at the Atlantic, which symbolized freedom. And so he rented this cottage here in the hamlet of Zenor, 
midway between Penzance and St. Ives, and tried to import a kind of freedom into a country which seemed to have lost it. For the most part, Lawrence and Frieda were alone, although they weren't left alone. The state interfered. The military authorities insisted on calling up Lawrence to see whether his body was fit to be turned into cannon fodder. Medical officers probed it, derided it, impaired Lawrence's dignity, but Lawrence's tuberculosis gave them their answer. Lawrence, with this thin, sick, white body, was not a dying man. He was a man raging with life. The face was the face of a major prophet, the bristling red beard and the fierce eyes. But he was obviously a dangerous man, a dissident, an outsider. The hypocrisy of a country that was waging war against his wife's own nation did impair Lawrence's patriotism very severely. It didn't make him pro-German, but he became anti-British in a very idiosyncratic way. Nobody loved England more than Lawrence did, but he felt England had betrayed herself. She turned herself into a puling, dribbling monster of sanctimonious commercialism. England had been a lion among nations, a roaring beast, the England of Chaucer and Shakespeare and Fielding and William Blake, but now she'd become so much dead mutton. It was in 1915 the old world ended. In the winter of 1915-1916, the spirit of the old London collapsed. Genuine debasement began. The unspeakable baseness of the press and the public voice, the reign of that bloated ignominy, John Bull. We hear so much of the bravery and horrors at the front, but we hear too little of the collapse of the proud human spirit at home, the triumph of sordid, rampant, raging meanness. At home stayed all the jackals, middle-aged male and female jackals, and they bit us all. Away in the West, they lived alone in their cottage by the savage Atlantic. He hated the war and said so to the few Cornish people around. And because of his isolation and his absolute separateness, he was marked out as a spy. Trapped in wartime Cornwall, the only solace Lawrence could find in a militarised England full of jackals and hyenas was in a vision of the ancient Celtic past in which, as he might have put it, altars were raised, not in the desiccated brain, but in the living loins. Cornwall is a country that makes a man psychic. The longer he stayed, the more intensely it had that effect on him. It was as if he were developing second sight and second hearing. He would go out and call, call softly for the spirits, the presences he felt coming down from the moors in the night. To Arthur de Danan, he would call softly. To Arthur de Danan, be with me. And it was as if he felt them come. The days grew shorter before the corn was all down from the moors, and then the Cornish night would gradually come down upon the dark, shaggy moors that were like the fur of some beast, and upon the pale grey granite masses, so ancient and druidical, suggesting blood sacrifice. He felt he was over the border in another world, over the border in that twilight, awesome world of the previous Celts, and at the same time to understand most sensitively the dark flicker of animal life about him. Rise then, life, he seemed to say to the things. And he no longer saw its sickeningness. The war was over, but the jackals were still there. 
Lawrence requested permission to leave the country, his right as a free man, but the bureaucratic jackals were very slow in granting him a passport. England didn't want him, but England seemed very reluctant to let him go. As for Lawrence, he'd made up his mind to leave England for good and start what he called his savage pilgrimage. He was looking for a country dimly prefigured in the woods and fields of the Nottinghamshire of his boyhood and described in the somewhat brutal but honest male life of the miners. He was looking for a country whose nature he only imperfectly saw himself, in which magic ruled rather than reason, in which there was sexual harmony and total free play for the instincts, a country in which was practiced what Lawrence called a kind of phallic worship. No such country has ever really existed except in Lawrence's imagination. Nevertheless, he was determined to find it, and so he set off. England was finished, and he was finished with England. He knew he was being watched all the time. Strange men questioning the cottage woman next door as to all his doings. He began to feel a criminal. A sense of guilt, of self-horror began to grow up in him. He saw himself set apart from mankind, a cane, or worse. So he discovered the great secret, to stand alone as his own judge of himself, absolutely. Then the mongrel-mouthed world would say and do what it liked. He felt broken off from his fellow men. He felt broken off from the England he had belonged to. The ties were gone. He was loose like a single timber of some wrecked ship drifting over the face of the earth, without a people, without a land. So be it. He was broken apart. Apart, he would remain. A lizard ran out on a rock and looked up, listening, no doubt, to the sounding of the spheres. And what a dandy fellow, the right toss of the chin for you and swirl of a tail. If men were as much men as lizards are lizards, they'd be worth looking at. A lizard was a lizard, but men had ceased to be men, except perhaps in the countries which Lawrence was yet to discover. On his voyage of discovery, he visited many countries, and to all of them he brought the gifts that had been nurtured when he was a boy and a young man in Nottinghamshire searching spirit, capacity for empathy, for entering into the life of people, places and things, a miraculous eye for notating the surface of nature. His feeling, his reverence for beasts and birds and fish and even plants is unmatched in the whole of English literature, unmatched even by Blake or by Wordsworth. This feeling for things is something that makes Lawrence quite exceptional. Even in his domestic life, while Frida Lawrence lay in bed, lazily smoking cigarettes, Lawrence scrubbed floors, got water from the well, chopped wood, prepared the meals, washed her underwear, picked figs. When he made a fire, the fire would always go. He never rose above this respect for the simple skills of the peasant and the artisan. 